All right, so the purpose of this video is to provide additional material to be used alongside the user manual. So what you'll notice here is I have the user guide for Tyco version 3.0. This is the PDF document. So the first step is that if you are a new user of the Tyco software, then you need to configure which video device to use. So Tyco does require a dedicated video card. And the reason behind that is that it implements a technique called synthetic tracking, which is computationally intensive. So if you were to run it through the CPU as opposed to GPU, which is a graphics processing unit, then it would take considerably longer to process the data than if you were to run it through a dedicated video card. A video card has the advantage of being able to process the data in a highly parallel fashion, so it's very quick. So that's what we want. So the first step then is to navigate to the OpenCL menu, choose Device Selector, and that presents us with a list of available video cards. So you'll notice I have an NVIDIA RTX 2080, so I will be using that as my video card. Now, if it were to present you with an option such as Intel HD graphics, you do not want that because those are integrated graphics as opposed to dedicated. So what you want is either NVIDIA or AMD or some other dedicated video card. So with that out of the way, the next step is to download the example data set. So you can download it either through the link here in the PDF document, or you can go to the Tyco website and choose data sets. And uh, there's a link data set for Tyco user guide. So I will download it here. And once it has finished downloading, then I will proceed to extract the archive and then load the images into the Tyco software. So you'll notice that there are 60 exposures here and they're each two minutes in duration, 120 seconds. So before we can run these images through the tracker, we need to process them up front using either express mode or perform these steps individually. I like to do express mode because it helps to automate this part of the process routine. So if I open up express mode and it shows me different steps that I can perform in sequence. So calibration, alignment, uh, binning, which I never really use that, uh, normalization and plate solving. So the first thing you'll notice with these, with these images is that they have already been calibrated. So, and that is because I acquired them through the itelescope.net service, which provides the images in a calibrated fashion. So, and that being the case, I do not need to perform calibration, but if I did, I would simply check this box and then choose the settings that would be relevant. So the dark frame, the flat frame, and so forth. Now, alignment is very critical. So you can choose, in this case, one of two different programs to achieve alignment, or you could use your own alignment software. It simply just won't be part of the Express uh, routine. So Registar is one option, PixInsight is another. Uh, I have noticed that Registar tends to do better when a meridian flip has occurred throughout the acquisition of the images, whereas PixInsight actually seems to do a little bit better at resampling the data. Uh, they are both very good programs, so if you have one, just go ahead and use it. Uh, but in either case, uh, since I'm using Registar, and if I am a first-time user here, then I would go to Settings and Registar, and then I would specify the path to the Registar executable. Uh, on the other hand, if I were using PixInsight, I would go to Settings, PixInsight, and choose the path to the PixInsight executable. Again, it saves that information so you do not have to do this each time. So the next step would be normalization. So this achieves a consistent background level from one image to the next. So that helps to uh, ensure that a moving object has consistent amplitude from one frame to the next. And so that helps the tracker evaluate the quality of the track. Finally, the last step here is plate solving. So you can see the settings here. So I am using an offline version of astrometry.net. The user guide goes into that in a bit more detail. But suffice to say, these are the settings that work 99% of the time. So I'm going to use them. We only have to plate solve the first image because they will have been aligned. So that saves time. So that, with that out of the way, we can go ahead and click Start. And you'll notice that it has invoked the Registar application. 
So the images are now being aligned. So 60 images will give it a moment to do that. Okay, so it is now saving the result. And normalization is now being performed and finally plate solving. Okay, so it has output the results of this directory so we can navigate here. All right, so at this point we can proceed to run the tracker but before we do so, we could just simply inspect the images very quickly by going to Action, View Images. So we now have an image viewer. And so we can zoom out, we can zoom in, that sort of thing. Uh, we could create a stack of the images, so you can see that here. But what we're interested in, of course, is uh, tracking uh, moving objects. So I will go ahead and run the synthetic tracker. So we choose this menu item here and the first thing is to specify a star subtraction threshold in other words this is a threshold for which stationary objects such as stars will be filtered out 99 percent of the time auto threshold is what you want so i will go ahead and click that um, you could adjust it manually yourself there's a course adjustment slider here and a fine adjustment slider as well so these are just different ways to achieve a desired threshold setting. But auto threshold, again, that works almost all the time. So click that button, click OK. The next step then is to specify a sensitivity threshold. So lower means that it would be more sensitive, which means that uh, it will detect the fainter objects, but it will also pick up more false detections. So I'm going to use the settings specified in the user manual, which is 20. Okay, last thing here before we run the tracker is to specify what we want to search for. So as you can see, it computes a max object speed. This is how fast the object is moving uh, in terms of angular motion. So this is in arc seconds per minute. And it computes this value based upon the exposure times and the delta time between exposures and, and that sort of thing. So it has computed what it thinks is a max speed that would uh, generate a, uh, an object with potentially up to four pixels in streak. So if you exposed for two minutes, um, then, and, and of course it, it's dependent on your plate scale as well, but uh, at two minutes exposure, uh, objects will have more of a streak than if you were to do a one minute exposure. So it, it depends on your exposure time as well as your plate scale, but uh, in any case this would uh, track objects that have up to four pixels in streak uh, by default. If you want to increase this, you can do so. Uh, you can also reduce it, but that is a default value that you can adjust if you want. So advanced settings here, these are useful. If you are conducting a search of a known object, you can limit the speed, you can limit the position angle, but in this example, we're going to open it up all the way. So 121,000 motion vectors, so it's going to conduct um, a very wide search. So objects that are up to that speed and any position angle. And we're going to enable multi-threading. So not only is it using the GPU for acceleration, but it is also going to run four instances of it. So, all right, it is now time to run the tracker. So I will click OK. And so this will take a moment. So I'll go ahead and pause the recording. All right, so it is just about finished. I'll give it a moment here to finish up. Okay, so these are the results that it came back with. So these are all the tracks, uh, 36 tracks returned. So first thing we can do is load up the MPC orbital database, which provides us a way in which to identify 
whether or not some of these tracks are associated with known objects. So we click that and then it proceeds to match these tracks uh, as follows. So the first item here, this is a known asteroid. This is the provisional name. This is the number of the asteroid. So if I click on it, the image viewer is presented here. And so uh, another thing to point out, so track combine is a very useful window. So what you're looking at is an image of the asteroid here. And um, it stands out fairly well against the background. So that's, that helps to reinforce that it is, in fact, a true detection. Uh, another way to look at it is this window here, the track positions. So I can go uh, from the first image, and I can scroll. And if I zoom in, you can see it better. But uh, here, here, here is the asteroid here. So again, the first image, and then I scroll through. So you can see the movement quite well. So that's the detection uh, of that asteroid. And then I can use my right arrow key on the keyboard to go to the next track. Or I could have clicked it in, in the window here. But anyway, um, so I'm just navigating through the tracks and I'm looking at the result. So these are all true detections of different asteroids. So this one here did not match up with a known asteroid, uh, at least as far as the NPC orbital database is concerned. That doesn't necessarily mean that it is a new detection, or at least of a, of a new asteroid. Uh, what I mean to say it is that it does not necessarily follow that this is a new discovery. So it, it is a starting point uh, whenever you're, it does not match with a known asteroid that is of course, a, a starting point to a potential discovery. But just because it doesn't show up in the MPC orbital database, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is a new object. OK, so yeah, we can continue to go through here um, and you know, position window here. We can also create stacks of the objects by selecting uh, multiple frames. But uh, if we wanted to, we could also load up the star catalog. And what that allows us to do is then create observations of these objects. So I can click verify track. And the way I got to that was I right clicked on the track and then chose verify track. So this gives us a, an animation. And it, since it looks like a valid object, which it is, then I can choose add observations. So it populates these windows with the object name. And when I click OK, we now have another window with the observations. So this, this is the first observation. So I can click on it. And you'll notice a green crosshair indicating the centroid of the observation. And I can choose the next observation here and finally the third one here. So these look like good detections. And if we wanted to, we can compare with existing observations. So the way I did this was I select the observations, I choose right click, and view with existing observations. So that downloads all the other observations of the object up to this point. And again, this data set was captured last year. So I'm going to look at where it was. It was 2018, September 10. So I'm going to delete the originally submitted observations of, of this object and then compare these new observations. So I can invoke find orb software and this is going to tell me how good the measurements are in relation to the other measurements. So here they are, uh, 0.19, I'm sorry, 0.20 uh, is the max residual of the three observations. So that's very good. And so, um, of course, these have an X next to them. So uh, that means that they're not exactly um, included with the rest of the orbit solution. So I need to click filter obs first. And this gives a more precise result. So 
0.24 is the max residual. So again, very good. Um, the general rule is as long as the measurement is under one um, uh, arc second uh, in error, then it is a good measurement. So 0.24 arc second is, is quite good uh, for this instrument. So, okay, uh, we, what I have shown here basically is that we are able to go through the tracks and um, create observations. And in fact, if you have, for example, an unknown object here, then you can verify it, just like I showed with the other object. And it will not have these windows populated, but it will have the tracklet ID. So again, you can go over here and then choose to, again, you can look at the centroid and all that. But anyway, these are valid observations. So right click, and you cannot do existing observations because uh, there simply is no um, no other no match with the known object. But what you can do is you can copy these observations and go to the Minor Planet Center website and choose the MP Checker tool. So you can then determine whether or not they match up with the known object here. So produce list. And it takes just a moment. But it is a way to confirm to another extent whether or not it may be potentially a new object. So, so indeed, um, they do not seem to match it with any other known object. So potentially it is a new discovery. When I took these images, I did not bother following up the observations. So um, I'm sure they're in the isolated tracklet file somewhere. But anyhow, um, I hope this has shown you a path forward on how to use the Tyco software. So thanks for watching and see you next time.